Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, and I am on. Thank you all very much for taking the time to be with me here in the FLIR booth today. As my good friend Bruce mentioned, we're going to be talking about search and rescue using drones for good. Um, my name is Patrick Sherman. I am a member of a group called the Roswell Flight Test Crew. That's one of our drones right there, flying in front of a major structure fire. I'm pleased to report that this was a training exercise. We didn't actually burn a house down just to watch it go on that. Um, so that's us. We've been, um, we're an educational nonprofit and drone service provider uh, based in Portland, Oregon, not far down the road from where our friends at FLIR are. Um, I've been, uh, I've been, we've been running a YouTube channel since 2011 telling people about drones. And uh, as Bruce alluded to, I write for pretty much every magazine that covers the subject of drones at this point. He did exaggerate by about one order of magnitude when he said I'd written a thousand articles. It's probably a lot closer to a hundred, but I have been at it a while. Um, we've been flying with uh, first responders, specifically firefighters, since 2011. And we've uh, been flying with thermal imaging cameras since 2012, so we have some background in this. Owing to the constrained uh, time uh, position we're in, uh, let's hold any questions till the end. I'll be happy to meet with you uh, around somewhere at the booth here, wherever is comfortable, but they want me to keep moving here so we don't bog down and so everybody can see the ghost hunter, which is the person I'm sure you all really want to see. Anyway, to begin with, what is thermal imaging? To understand thermal imaging, let's begin by talking about visible light imaging. What you see here on the screen is the visible light spectrum, which was first introduced to us by Sir Isaac Newton. And as you all recognize, on the far, on that side of the screen, on the right side of the screen, we have the violet, with the shortest wavelength our human eyes can perceive. And on the left, we have red, the longest wavelength we can perceive. But as I'm sure you all recognize, there is additional light, if you will, which exists beyond that. Beyond violet, it's what we call ultraviolet. And beyond red, we have the infrared. Now, what thermal imaging does is allow us to perceive a portion of the infrared spectrum, which we cannot see with our own eyes. So it makes the invisible visible. And this has an all, a number of sort of interesting implications to it, which aren't all necessarily intuitive. So we're going to spend a couple minutes and talk about how this works in real life. First thing to be aware of is that because it's in the infrared spectrum, which eyes, or our eyes don't perceive, we don't, there is no red or blue or green or yellow in the infrared spectrum. There are no colors there. So when we're using a thermal imaging camera, like the ones made by FLIR, we get to choose what colors we want to represent the world. And this being thermal, things are arranged between hot and cold. So on the, uh, all the way over here, on the left side of the screen, is the hottest thing. All the way over on the right is the coldest. So maybe you want the hottest thing to be white and the coldest black. There's the white hot color palette for you. Say you want it the other way around. There's the black hot color palette for you. And you can choose all these different ones. Typically for tactical applications like firefighting, the military, you tend to use either the white hot or the black hot because it looks most like a black and white image which our eyes are already familiar with. Some of these more esoteric ones like lava and iron bow are used in industrial applications, but it can be hard to decide, is that a tree or a house when it's all these different colors? So let's take a look at this in a practical situation. Here we see a, uh, a structure fire. This is a single story ranch style home with a fire inside of it. And um, this is the black hot color palette. Now you'll notice that the, uh, the, the entire house is very dark in color because there's a fire burning inside it. That's heating up the whole house. You'll notice there is some black around the perimeter. The little black objects are the firefighters themselves. That's their body heat radiating out through their turnouts. And then way up in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you see a black square. That's actually an incident command vehicle with its engine running. So that's the heat from the internal combustion engine. So now I'm going to show you, and this obviously was captured by a drone hovering over the scene. Now I'm going to show you uh, the, the exact same scene rendered in the white hot color palette. So now you guys see they're just inverted images of each other. Here the warmest things in the frame are white, the house on fire, um, and the firefighters in the incident command vehicle. And here again is the same scene in the iron bow color palette. Now notice here that the, um, 
We can maybe pick out the temperature variations, get a little too close to my speaker. We can pick out the temperature variations a little more cleanly because we have more colors to choose from. But as you can see, the shapes begin to look a little more abstract. And then finally, here's the exact same scene in visible light. And one thing you notice immediately is there's smoke coming out of that structure. And the smoke completely disappears in the thermal imaging, which is why firefighters are so fond of thermal imaging. Smoke does not exist when you're using a thermal imaging camera. You look right through it like it's not even there. So that's sort of a primer on what thermal imaging is. Now let's take a few minutes to discuss what thermal imaging isn't. First and foremost, Thermal imaging is not magic. Harry Potter fans, I'm sorry to break that to you, but it's a, it's a tool with strengths and limitations like any other tool. So, for example, if you watch movies about spies on television, you've almost certainly seen someone with a thermal imager look at a guy walking through the wall. That doesn't work, and I'll prove it right now. That's me, obviously. And in front of my face, I'm holding an ordinary pane of window glass. That's glass, just like in your house. And as you can see, and as you all well know, photons, visible light photons, pass right through glass. However, in the thermal image, white hot palette, on the right, you can see that the glass completely occludes the thermal photons. Next thing thermal imaging is not. Thermal imaging is not night vision. It will allow you to see at night, but it's not night vision. In night vision, you take the very limited amount of light available in the scene, and you amp it up so you can see. But as I said, thermal imaging allows you to see at night. Here's again two images, one visible light, one thermal. And the left-hand image, you can see this guy, but only because he's got that light behind him silhouetting him. When he takes just one or two more steps off, he's going to be completely invisible. But on the right-hand side, on the thermal imager, he just stands out plain as day, and it doesn't matter if he's in light or not. And it would look pretty much exactly the same if he was here in the daylight. So that's the advantage of thermal. It works equally well day or night. And finally, thermal imaging is not NDVI, normative difference vegetative index, which is the tool which is gaining a lot of traction with farmers right now using drones, where they can look at a plant, look at the amount of light being reflected in the red spectrum and the near infrared spectrum, and tell you something about the health of the plant. The, um, the, uh, the FLIR thermal imagers look much deeper in the infrared spectrum. On this scale, the FLIR imager would probably be somewhere over in the DGL booth over there. So it's in the middle and long wave infrared. All right. So for all of the search and rescue cases, the emergency response scenarios you're about to see, we're using more or less this camera. This is the FLIR View Pro. Uh, it's an uncooled camera. It's about that big. I'm sure there's one around here they can show you. Uh, the resolution is 640 by 512, which that's low for if you've got a digital camera, but that's considered high res in the thermal world. Now, when we started flying them, the view did not exist. We had to take essentially the same underlying technology, which is the Tau 2 imager, and sort of bodge it together to work on board a drone. The view has really been, for those of us who work with this technology, the view has been wonderful because it builds in recording capability, makes it very easy to get a live video stream out to plug into the drone. Very nice tool. But So all the images you're about to see are taken, not with this imager, but with its one step back. And it's all essentially all the same underlying technology. So first use case is search and rescue. And this is a hasty river search. The scenario here is that a person has gone swimming, swimming in the Willamette River here, back in our home state of Oregon, and they got into trouble. Somebody saw, uh, saw them in trouble, called it in, the local fire department turned out. So everyone, take a close look at that photo and, and find the, the, the missing victim if they made it to shore. Every, everybody see him? You know right where he is? All right, let's, let's, see, let's see if the thermal camera can help us. Oh, up there on the bank of the island, right there, that's our guy. See how he stands out? Let's go back to the, uh, the visible. You simply cannot see him. He's standing right there. He's a firefighter wearing a blue shirt, but you just can't see him. But on thermal, you know right where he is immediately. So I think you begin to appreciate when you combine the capabilities of thermal imaging with the aerial perspective provided by drones, that this can be a very, very powerful tool for emergency responders. Whoop. Next use case, wildland firefighting. 
Uh, this was a prescribed burn to take clear out invasive species in a neighborhood in my hometown of Portland, Oregon. And uh, that's actually me standing next to the firefighter with the water hose. The exercise is pretty much over at this point. As you can see, there's no active flame. And the firefighter is obviously dousing this field to make sure the fire is good and out. And um, the, their biggest concern, they told me, before they went to do this, was they don't want a hot spot to be hiding there somewhere and flare back up and launch sparks to create a fire later that evening when the firefighters are gone. So they're really worried about hot spots. But I think we can all agree that wherever you see this black, where, which he's just doused with a hose, that fire is officially out. They'll go on and get the rest of the white ash area, which is still sort of smoldering. But the black area, everything's out, right? Or if there is a hot spot there, can anybody point it out to me? Well, I think you're starting to get the game now. Let's check the thermal imager. And whoa, right there, right in front of the firefighter, we've got some hot spots, which have somehow survived being completely saturated with the fire hose. And again, the thermal imager on board the drone makes it possible for us to go out and acquire this information and just see it plain as day. All right, another scenario, structural firefighting. And this is, this is one which always gets to me because it really points out the, the courage of our firefighters. Um, this is a, uh, these are three firefighters on the roof of a burn building. It's made of solid concrete and it's protected by, you know, fireproof tiles like on the space shuttle. So it, they can do whatever they want and they can burn it all day, it's not going to collapse. But um, what they, a, a common tactic in firefighting, which they are practicing here, is to go up on the roof of a burning structure and cut a hole in the roof with a chainsaw. And what that does, it allows the heat to begin to escape from the building. And um, if you all recall from your grade school, the fire triangle, to burn a fire needs three things. It needs heat, it needs oxygen, and it needs fuel. So if you cut a hole in the roof and let some of that heat escape, you essentially turn down the volume on the whole fire. Now that's obviously great, that's wonderful. The, the one peril is you're putting people on the roof of a burning building. And firefighters in this country are killed every year when they fall through those roofs right into the middle of the burning building. So obviously a very perilous situation here. That's not going to happen. Like I said, this is a concrete roof here. And that's where you see flames coming out, that's actually what they call a prop. So these guys can practice that maneuver in safety. But we're going to go back to that single story structure we started with. This is the iron bow color palette, obviously. And I want you to look closely at it and see what you're seeing here. It's immediately clear to all of you, I'm sure, where the fire is inside the structure. And the, the high resolution of the uh, Tau-2 thermal imager allows us to see not only the fire in the structure, but also the individual roof joists. And it kind of maybe looks like um, a Chinese lantern with a paper, and you can see the roof joists would be the ribs. But think for a moment what we're looking at here. This is not visible light. This is a thermal image. So the roof joists aren't casting shadows, they're actually cooler than everything else because they have thermal mass, they're heating up, but for the moment they're still cooler than the surroundings, except right over where the fire is burning. You can see the roof joists have completely disappeared, and why that's happened is because the roof joists are the same temperature as the fire, which means, of course, they themselves are on fire. So you would not, under any circumstances, want to put firefighters on that spot in the roof, but say on the other limb of the house, you could contemplate it, it would be safe. Right now, firefighters have no way of gathering this information, but again, you put a drone in the air, just for 30 seconds, you can gain an amazing amount of information with a thermal imager. A final uh, scenario, hazardous materials response, and this frankly is the one that always makes my skin crawl. And I have to warn you, you will never, none of you will ever look at a train the same way after I show you these next couple of slides. So if you love trains, step away now. Okay, this is a rail yard in Eugene, Oregon. Um, you can see all these rail cars just hanging out here. One of these rail cars is primed to bring death and destruction to your hometown. Can you point out which one it is to me? The deadly rail car? Yeah. It's, it's not a fair question. You guys are on to the game now. There, now take a closer look. You'll notice of all the rail cars, one of them is mysteriously glowing on the thermal imager about halfway up this train here. What's going on there? And there it is, right there. This was, we actually didn't know this was there. We put it up. The fire commander we were working with said, let's take a closer look at that. So we swooped in, and it ended up being this car right here, the hazmat placard. 2312, 
which is molten phenol. It's used in the manufacture of glues and adhesives, and it is deadly, deadly stuff. As you can tell from the name molten, it's shipped hot, goes all over the country like this. And the firefighters told me, if you get seven square inches of this stuff anywhere on your skin, you are dead. That is the end of you. So as you can imagine, if this tanker was leaking, the response protocol is enormously time-consuming. Four guys suit up in hazmat suits, and they, go, they trek downrange to go, so they can read this placard and take a look at the spill. In the meantime, another four guys are suited up just standing there in case the first four guys get into trouble. Fire commander told me it'll take about an hour to determine what's leaking, you know, how bad the spill is, etc. We were able to get that information in like two minutes. And again, with the thermal imager, had there actually been a leak, it would have been very easy to establish the perimeter of that leak, you know, where it was going, how quickly it was spreading, etc. So that concludes my talk. I hope in the time that we've had together, I've helped you understand how drones equipped with thermal imagers